could be. Who knows? There's something to any day. I will know right away, soon as it shows. It may come cannonball and jump from the sky, gleam in its eye bright as a rose. And there's a miracle too Gonna come true Coming to me Could it be? Yes it could Something's coming Something good If I can't wait Something's coming I don't know what it is But it is gonna be great With a click With a shock Phone all jingle of new original musicals in development. And of course, thank you for coming to hear me simply singing Sondheim. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> we'll get to the almost part a little bit later. But Sondheim songs are my favorite. Ironic, enigmatic, messy. Like me sometimes. In fact, sometimes. My life itself feels like a Sondheim musical. <laughs> Something will happen which will trigger in my mind a line or a lyric from one of his shows. <laughs> Sometimes things just pop into me head, <laughs> as Mrs. Lovett would say. <clears throat> Who else does that? <laughs> oh, I hear some. <laughs> It's okay, the rest of you, you know who you are. <laughs> Sondheim's shows are my musical theater holy grail, so what better way to tell my story than through his words and music? How did I get to be here? How did I get to be me? I can't wait to share some of my old roles and songs from shows of his I've already done, and some I haven't yet. <laughs> 
and maybe even some of those that'll only do when pigs fly, <laughs> or at least uh, unless I uh, have epic non-traditional casting, or unless I come back in my next lifetime as heavier, or female, or white, or maybe all three. <laughs> I can finally play Mama Rose! Oh look, there's a flying pig now. <laughs> what? I have friends who want to play Mama Rose. <laughs> I bet some of them are in this room right now. <laughs> some of them are even women. <laughs> and the rest of you know who you are. <laughs> My hometown of Strongsville, Ohio, which according to Wikipedia, is an affluent suburb 18 miles southwest of Cleveland, is now a land of strip mall shopping, tract housing subdivisions, and a Westfield Plaza. But back when I was growing up, it was on the edge of the rural farming district where some of my friends' backyards could be measured in acres. I remember playing by streams in the woods in the summertime and playing hockey on the frozen ponds in the wintertime, all very Norman Rockwell. Back then I was a real science fiction nut. My favorite TV shows were Lost in Space and Star Trek. And I must have read every science fiction book in the Strongsville Library by the time I was 14. Uh, I love fantasizing being one of those space travelers, exploring the universe. And sometimes I was even sure I was actually an alien sent to live here among humans on Earth. <laughs> Why? I just felt different. I wouldn't understand all of the reasons for decades, but I only had to look in the mirror to see one reason literally staring me back in the face. I did not look like any of the other kids at school or in those classic Norman Rockwell scenes. <laughs> in fact, looking at my kindergarten school pictures, kind of like that game, which of these is not like the other? <laughs> I didn't discover until I was an adult that when my parents went to buy the family home, one of the neighbors objected to a Chinese family moving into the all-white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My parents wouldn't buy the house until the real estate agent canvassed the rest of the neighborhood to sign a statement saying they would welcome us. Pretty wild, right? <laughs> Well, did you know that at the turn of the 20th century, while millions of white immigrants were pouring into Ellis Island, federal law actually barred almost all legal immigration of Chinese people, including my grandfather, and that he only obtained citizenship papers after the great 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire destroyed the Hall of Records. And with it, any way of disputing his claim of being legal or his application for replacement papers. <laughs> what I call taking lemons and making lemonade. <laughs> no one ever told me any of this when I was a child. But you know, kids understand more than we realize. Somehow, I already knew that I didn't quite fit in. To accept, to belong, the old question, the old song, home sweet home, Home base, wish I knew my place. Oh, where do I belong? Am I the only one who finds the sun too bright, too revealingly strong? Am I the only one? Waits and looks and waits and contemplates the night, feeling lonely. In the night, when the world's asleep, I can let my mask slip, but the light brings a world of people asking, looking, looking, asking where.
case you're wondering, that is not the almost part of the show. <laughs> Stephen Sondheim wrote Where Do I Belong while he was still a college student for a never produced show called Climb High. He put his feelings about being an outsider into his writing. Others who feel like they don't belong might act out, get into trouble. I was the opposite side of that coin. In order to fit in and to feel accepted, I was the stereotypical good Asian boy, the model student, always doing what I was supposed to do, always trying to be better than just in order to feel good enough. More socially acceptable, perhaps, but still just a band-aid, a quick fix. As unsettled as Mama Rose, I just couldn't see myself staying in the Ohio humdrum around me. And as restless as Tony, always looking around the corner for something just out of reach and finally realizing it wasn't going to be in Strongsville. So, I decided to go to college in California! I love the warm sunny weather and the beauty of the mountains and the ocean is so different from Ohio. But what I liked the best about California was the idea of California where anything and everything seemed possible. My parents were nervous about letting me go to a big city but finally agreed on the compromise of UC Davis in the Sacramento Valley, which seemed like a more conservative, Midwest-style college town transplanted into radical California. <laughs> <laughs> kind of California light. <laughs> I'm on my way, completely on my own. I'm on my way, and that's all that I'm certain of. I'm on my way to a world I've never known. things to get used to about living in California was actually being around so many other Asian people. <laughs> Back in Ohio, I never even met another non-white schoolmate except for my younger sister Robbie until he was in the seventh grade. When I was six, a new family moved into the house behind us and they had a boy my age named David. Now I remember when I first met David, I announced very proudly, I'm Chinese American, because that's what my parents had taught me. <laughs> a very Caucasian David looked kind of puzzled for a moment, and then exclaimed back, I am too! <laughs> and we were instant great friends, although clearly he had no idea what Chinese American meant. <laughs> and to be honest, I guess I didn't die there. <laughs> we did have Chinese artwork in the house. We did go to my parents' favorite Chinese restaurant, the Changhua, in downtown Cleveland, Chinatown. Chinatown. And I did grudgingly learn to count to ten in Chinese to show off for the grandparents. <laughs> but I did want to be different. I wanted to be like my friends, to fit in. But when I moved to California, I didn't really fit in all that well either. <laughs> It was the time of the Asian movement. Anybody remember that? When Asian students were actively exploring and embracing their cultural heritage. To a lot of them, I wasn't Asian enough. <laughs> I was what was called a banana. Yellow on the outside, white on the inside. <laughs> so what should I mean? A pineapple, yellow through and through? I mean, there was a guy in my freshman dormitory, Scott Wong who actually used to walk around the hallways brandishing nunchucks. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> no! <laughs> but there were other Asian students that were more like me, and eventually I began to feel more comfortable with my own Asianness. I even took a year of Mandarin Chinese. Welcome, Grandma and Grandpa. <laughs> I love UC Davis. But it still wasn't the real California of my dreams. So when it came time to go to grad school, I was thrilled to be accepted at UCLA. I mean, big city Los Angeles, where I was sure there was everything I could ever want. Driving down from Davis, I still remember that feeling of anticipation and excitement on that last steep climb up the 405 freeway out of the valley. <laughs> it felt symbolic. I was reaching the mountain top at last. When you're way up high and you look below at the world you left and the things you know, little more than a glance is enough to show you just how small you are. When you're way up high and you're on your own in a world like 
none that you've ever known Where the sky is lead and the earth is stone You're free to do whatever pleases you Exploring things you never dare Big city lights, perfect weather, Hollywood Instead of moving to a new city, in a strange way, it almost felt like I was coming home. This is where I belonged. God, I love this town. Don't you love this town? It's got all of these opportunities. Can't afford to turn them down. Some may not work up, some go up to spot plenty more around the corner. And what's coming around the corner, that's what life's about. Gotta love it here, don't you love it here? Everywhere you look is an open book, every screen's a new frontier. Time to go explore, time to know the score, plenty more around the corner. And what's coming around the corner, that's what life's about. L.A. really does have everything, including the nation's longest-running professional theater of color, the East-West Players, where I first sang Giants in the Sky. playing Jack in Into the Woods. Oh, a few years ago. Okay, many years ago. <laughs> East West Players was one of those few places where Asian American actors could actually be cast in roles usually cast elsewhere with only Caucasian actors. Oh, and Hollywood's even worse. I mean, have you seen the new Into the Woods movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, the only main character of color was fake Milky White, the brown cow. <laughs> and even she had to be covered in white flower face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you can't even get casting diversity in a fairy tale. <laughs> Without East West Players, where could I have learned what I did as a musical theater actor doing seven different Sondheim shows there? Where else could I have played roles like Anthony and Sweeney Todd? I feel you, Joanna. I feel you. I was half convinced I'd wake and satisfied enough to dream you. Happily, I was mistaken, Joanna. changed for ethnicity, but in Sweeney Todd, the character of Joanna is specifically written to have yellow hair. Blonde Asian American actresses are in somewhat short supply, so we wrote to Sondheim for help, and he was ready for a solution for me to sing to my Asian Joanna. shade of hair color, which of course is the exact shade of hair color as Joanna's. There's tawny and there's golden saffron, there's flaxen and there's blonde. There's coarse and straight, there's fine and curly, there's gray, there's white, there's ash, there's pearly, there's corn, yellow, buff and ochre, and straw and apricot. 
13 more shades of yellow hair? <laughs> really? Steve, I'd help! Our imaginations went wild, trying to predict what he might come up with. Maybe something like... There's sable and there's dark as midnight, there's charcoal and there's black. There's ebony, pitch and inky, and coal and stingy and... <laughs> well, you know, stingy <laughs> Defined as all or pertaining to the river Styx. Extremely dark, gloomy or forbidding, as in the Stygian blackness of the cave. <laughs> no? <laughs> oh, come on. You know that's exactly the kind of word Sondheim would use. <laughs> well, the whole cast is on pins and needles, waiting for his response. Finally, the answer arrives the oracle speaks! And Sondheim's decree is, you have my permission to cut the sequence. <laughs> what? No! You missed your chance to use Stygian again. In the frogs, the characters even crossed the river Styx, and you didn't use it there. It was the perfect second chance. What were you thinking? I, 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 sorry. <laughs> Some people say I overthink things. <laughs> well, at least it's a trait I share with many of Sondheim's characters. <laughs> now, as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap. Now, there are two possibilities. A, I could ravish your B, I could nap. <laughs> say, it's the ravish, but then we see the options that follow, of course. The adoption of physical force. Now, be my browser, but if I assume my trip on my trouser lane crossing the room, <laughs> her hair getting tangled, her stays getting snapped, my nerves will be jangled, my energy sapped. Removing her clothing would take me all day, and her subsequent loathing would turn me away, which eliminates B, which leaves us with A. <laughs> choices. Like all of us, sometimes characters are always pondering choices. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. I have a confession to make. Something I've hidden in the past. When I moved to LA to go to grad school, it was not for the MFA program in music, or theater, or filmmaking. No. <laughs> It was to attend the UCLA School of Medicine. There. I'm coming out as a physician, a doctor of internal medicine. Okay, now you know. Thank you for letting me get that off my chest and for not judging. Because so many people have asked me, but why not music? Why not the arts? I was a little like Phyllis Stone in Follies, torn between two identities itching to be switching roles. On one hand, there's my scientific medical left brain, and then there's my musical theater creative right brain, <laughs> and they're very different. They speak different languages, or at least words and acronym abbreviations mean very different things according to which one's interpreted. For example, to my left brain, MD is doctor of medicine. ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament, part of the knee frequently torn in sports injuries. And NPH is a kind of insulin used to control blood sugar levels and diabetes. But to my right brain, MD is musical director. ACL is a chorus line. And MPH is Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> so it's a conflict. <laughs> and the choice isn't easy to make. <laughs> I don't know, Jake, what should I talk about next? Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> music has always been a big part of my life. My mother was a musician, and my earliest memories from the age of three years old are lying in the dark after being put to bed at night and hearing her play the piano and sing in the other room. She was my first piano teacher, and I can't remember a time when I didn't sing. And no one ever told me not to go into music. But somehow, I think I already knew. 
Traditional old country Chinese immigrant expectations of getting a good education, getting ahead, securing your future, run strong and deep even for a third generation Chinese American. There is no other way. I mean, I love doing shows in junior high school and high school and even as a chemistry major at UC Davis, but I knew I'd have to, I wouldn't have time once I started medical school. It was time to choose between the diverging roads. You do take one road, you try one door, there isn't time for any more. One's life consists of either or. One has regrets, which one forgets. And as the years go on, the road you didn't take hardly comes to mind, does it? The door you didn't try, where could it have led? The choice you didn't make never was defined, was it? Dreams you never dared are dead, or were they ever there? Who said, I don't remember, I don't remember at all, not at all. Thank God, even as a medical student, I was still eligible to sign up for two hours a week of a piano practice room in the music department. How I cherish those two precious hours, my little ration of creativity. <laughs> One day. As I was walking into the music building, I heard singing coming from behind a closed door. It was unlocked, so I snuck in and found myself in the back of a small, darkened theater. On the stage, on the lighted stage, there was a female student striding back and forth, singing a song from Oliver. And there were about 20 other students in the front rows below me, singing a response. It's a fine life. Other students got up and sang songs too, and in between, the professor gave feedback and critique. I didn't want to leave. I mean, just to be a fly on the wall in that creative environment again was thrilling. I mean, I'd almost forgotten what it was like. And just for a moment, I tried to imagine what it might be like to be one of them. I wish more than anything, more than the moon, but of course, it was impossible. But a few weeks later, I got a surprise phone call from my friend Melanie. We had known each other at UC Davis from doing a production of Guys and Dolls, and she was transferring to the UCLA Theater Arts Department for winter quarter. So she started meeting me at my piano practice room, and we, I would play the piano, and we would sing together. One day, she told me about this great new class she had found, the UCLA Musical Theater Workshop, which turned out to be that same class I had stumbled upon myself. <laughs> Now, one of the class requirements was to do a two-person scene. And whether it was because there was an odd number of students in the workshop that quarter, or whether everybody else knew each other from fall quarter was already paired up, Melanie couldn't find a scene partner. So she went to the professor, Ellen Gilbert, to ask if she could do her scene with somebody from outside the class. Well, that, like, that's gonna happen, right? <laughs> but surprisingly, he said yes. <laughs> so, the last day of winter quarter, I went with Melanie to workshop, and we performed Shall We Dance from the King and I? <laughs> now I could see some of the other students were pointing at me and whispering among themselves, who is that? Because no one knew me from the music department, no one knew me from the theater department. But the scene went well, and Alan turned to me and said, I like your work. Would you like to join our class next quarter? Really? I was shocked. And a little voice in my head said, don't waste the time. Don't detract from your medical studies. Don't be irresponsible. But then there was another voice. <laughs> Make just a ripple. Come on, be brave. This time a ripple. Next time a wave. Sometimes you have to start small. Climbing the tiniest wall. Maybe you're going to fall. Stop, everybody says, mustn't rock the boat, mustn't touch a thing. Everybody says, don't, everybody says, wait, everybody says, can't fight City Hall, can't upset the cart, can't laugh at the king. Well, I say, try. I say, laugh at the kings of the 
will make you cry. Lose your poise. Fall if you have to, but body make a noise. Everybody says don't, everybody says can't, everybody says wait around for miracles. That's the way the world is made. I insist on miracles. If you do them, miracles. Nothing to them. I say don't. Don't be <laughs> that day was such a turning point for me. Everybody was wrong. My life didn't have to consist of either or. I didn't have to be sorry not to travel both roads in the yellow wood. In fact, maybe there aren't any roads at all. Maybe there are just trees. And why not just have the freedom to walk between whichever trees you want to and make your own road? Mm. What makes a gopher leave his hole, trembling with fear and fright? Maybe a gopher's got a soul, wanting to see the light. That's it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's it. The scripture has it writ. Man, your life, that's it. like chain. Don't the good Lord all around you make it plain? That is the eagle in me from the Sondheim show. <laughs> oh, that's right. This is the, the almost part of the show because yeah. Stephen Sondheim did not write that song. He only wishes he had. <laughs> Back in the year 2000, the Library of Congress sponsored a concert in Sondheim's honor made up of songs from a list they asked Sondheim to compile, the topic of which was, songs I wish I had written. <laughs> really? I mean, songs Sondheim wishes he had written? <laughs> when everybody else, all the other songwriters wish they could write the songs that Sondheim writes. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, the songwriters on this exclusive list were a veritable who's who of the American musical theater, including the legendary lyricist E. Y. Yip Harburg, who wrote the lyrics to The Eagle and Me for the 1944 Broadway musical, Bloomer Girl. <laughs> now, you may not know Yip Harburg's name, but I guarantee you know his work. Yeah. He's written some of the most famous and most beloved lyrics of all time. Where troubles smell like lemon drops, <laughs> away above the chimney tops, that's where you'll find We all know the rest. <laughs> I have a couple of ties to give myself. I was first bitten by the musical theater acting bug at age 13 when I was cast as one of the children in our local high school production of Finian's Rainbow, another Harvard show. Then, ten years later, at the UCLA Musical Theater Workshop, I had the great privilege and greater honor to meet and work directly with you when Professor Alan Gilbert, who was a, a veteran of both Broadway productions of Bloomer Girl and Phineas Rainbow, talked Yip into flying out to L.A. for six weeks to work with us on our spring show, Look to the Rainbow, which was a retrospective review of 20th century American history as seen through Yip's lyrics. Well, in fact... There are some of us before curtain on opening night. Which of these is not like the other? Yeah. Well, actually, this is a pretty more. This is a, a more of a mixture. Anyway, hmm. rose-colored aviator glasses, body permed hair, and rainbow-colored godspell suspenders seemed like such good ideas at the time. <laughs> they really did. But we were younger then. <laughs> anyway. My experience with Yip was literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I mean, even at over 80 years old, he was still, still so full of energy and so committed to his creativity, his craft, and his ideals. His love and his passion for his work was, was inspirational. When he joined us on stage, during the performance, 
He told the audience he thought of the scarecrow, the tin man, and the cowardly lion as his own alter egos. Hmm. And as he serenaded us with that iconic song, I absolutely knew that yearning for life to be better, to be more than it is. I would show in the forest who's king of this here forest, the king that took his serve. Why, with my rig of Beezer, I could be another Caesar if I only had the nerve. If I only had the nerve. <laughs> So, after the show closed, and you flew back to New York, we kept in touch by writing letters, and I saw him every now and then if he was in town. One time, Annette Funicello was filming one of her Skippy peanut butter commercials in my friend Jimmy's backyard swimming pool. I know, only in L.A., right? <laughs> anyway, it was February, and you know Annette was not going to be climbing into any cold winter water, so the production company paid big bucks to heat the pool to 90 degrees for a week. And in between shooting days, Jimmy said, come use the pool. <laughs> so one sunny afternoon I went, and by coincidence, Yip was in town, and he showed up too. Now, Jimmy wasn't home, so Yip and I had the place to ourselves for a couple hours, just swimming and talking, and you know, amazing, right? <laughs> now, Yip was a feisty kind of guy. He had a well-deserved reputation as being a maverick, as someone who liked to tweak the nose of convention. So I think it was right up his alley that I was a medical student who also did musical theater. I mean, you don't see that every day, right? I think he liked that. He told me I was a Renaissance man. I liked that. <laughs> and he advised me to continue pursuing both medicine and musical theater. He told me, your big conflict in life will be a plethora of fortune choices. Mm. <laughs> River, it liked to flow. Eagle, it liked to fly. Eagle, it liked to feel its wings against the sky. Possum, it liked to roam. Ivy, it liked to climb. Bird in the tree and bumblebee want freedom in autumn or summertime. being rare and inventive. Pretty high praise from a guy who knows his way around a lyric or two himself. <laughs> and I wondered why he chose this particular song for his list. So I wrote him and asked him. And again, he wrote me back. And he said one of his favorite all-time lyrics is, ever since that day when the world was an onion. Now when we did that song and looked at the rainbow, I thought it was kind of intriguing, but I didn't really think that much about it. And I don't think I really understood it that much. But now that I'm older, I get it. And I think that's how it's supposed to be, because life itself is like an onion, just waiting to be peeled, only revealing itself slowly, layer by layer. Along the way, it's going to make you cry a little bit. But when all said and done, the result is all the more delicious and satisfying because of it. Just like a Sondheim lyric. <laughs> and I like the fact that I didn't understand it when I was younger. Because now I know there are things I'm going to understand better when I'm older that I don't understand as well now. There's always room for life to grow richer and more meaningful with each passing layer. Ever since that day
Chris decided to fly out to visit me in, in LA here for the holidays. It was a tough choice. <laughs> December in LA! December in Ohio. <laughs> no brainer, right? <laughs> well, anyway, I was driving in the car with my mother, and I was telling her about the musical theater workshop and how much I loved it. Now, she was usually the talkative one, but was unusually quiet that day. Finally, she turned to me and said, do you feel your father and I stopped you from doing what you really wanted to do and pushed you into doing something else? Wow, didn't expect that. <laughs> Made me stop and think for a moment about all the lessons they had paid for, and all the times they had driven me to rehearsal, and all the shows of mine they'd come to see. And I said, You guys have always been great. I'm doing what I want to do. I don't know if I've ever loved them more than at that moment in the car. Because it showed me that. Even if I had decided to pursue a primary career in music or the arts, they might have worried, but somehow they would have found a way to be okay with it. They would have been supportive. And that's so huge, because I know it's not always that way. In fact, I have other Asian American actor friends who have told me that their parents have actually tried to use me to talk them out of going into show business. <laughs> be like Paul Wong and have a profession. <laughs> and do musicals on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, but why did you tell them my story in the first place? <laughs> it happens all the time. Even at an audition earlier this year. I was I worked with, I was friends with three of the four people in the audition room already, but I had never met the director. So I finished singing my song. And one of my friends turns to the director and says, and he's a doctor! <laughs> <laughs> I did book the job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I just have to get used to the fact that somehow people just can't help themselves talking about it. I mean, I myself try not to talk about it with new theater people, at least at the beginning. I mean, I don't want it to be the first thing they know about me. I want my work to speak for itself without any assumptions based on my other life. Oh, and believe me, it's happened. I have this actor friend. And we would invite each other to our shows, as actors do. And I'd seen a couple of his things, but he had never come to see any of mine. He also worked as a charity fundraiser, producing musical events using singers and our friends, mutual friends of ours, but had never used me. Whatever, right? Well, we had known each other about 10 years when I was doing Pacific Overtures, and after the show one day, I came out on the stage door, and there he was. Turns out he was there to see some of those other mutual friends that didn't even know I was in the show. And he rushes up to me and says, Paul, oh, I had no idea you were so good. How come you've never done any of our events? <laughs> Yeah. And he looked away sheepishly for a moment before turning back to me and said, Well, to be honest, I figure he's a doctor. How good can he be? Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Oh, the other thing I'll get is, Oh, the singing doctor, which I always hated. Yeah. I mean, it makes it sound like I'm not serious about either one. Yeah. And one has nothing to do with the other. I mean, when I'm in the clinic, I don't go around singing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't take my stethoscope to rehearsal. <laughs> when I'm doing a show, there's no particular advantage or disadvantage to being a doctor. <clears throat> Although I do have one other confession. I used to have this recurring nightmare. I'm doing a show, and all of a sudden, someone from the audience will call out, is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> there'd be only me. <laughs> and so I'd have to stop what I'm doing and perform CPR or something before finishing the show. <laughs> Fortunately, it's never happened. And I'm off the clock tonight, so please, nobody gets sick. <laughs> Although, once, there was this one medical emergency. It was the opening weekend for Sweeney Talk, a production that won five LA Ovation Awards, including one for set design. Now, the set and the center of the set were this eight foot tall platform, which was Sweeney's Barbershop, fitted with a trap door to drop his victims down to the big house and the floor uh, stage level below. During the second act opening number, God That's Good, 
I'm standing in the bakehouse singing, but hidden behind a curtain because my character Anthony isn't in that scene. We get to the part where Sweeney is testing out his barber chair. I can hear him singing above me on the platform. I'll pound three times, three times, and then you. Sweeney pulls the lever, the trapdoor falls right into my head. <laughs> it's my fault. I mean, I'm having so much fun singing, I wasn't paying attention to where I'm standing. It's getting dark and I'm seeing stars and I'm, it really hurts. It's wet and it's red. It's blood! Oh, and not Sweeney Todd blood, but real blood! <laughs> Where's the backstage mirror? It's running down my face. That's the end of the song. My solo's next. I have to clean up. Where are the paper towels? That's my intro. <laughs> I feel You can do this. Very oh. sweetly in your raven hair, Joanna. It's more like up on my eyebrow. <laughs> can anybody else see it? Shall I wipe it away? No, don't touch it. We'll show more or less. I don't know. What do you do? something here backstage I could use for a, a period-looking bandage. Maybe an old rag. Or maybe I could wear a hat. Does anyone still wear a hat? <laughs> a birthday kit! <laughs> really? Children's bandages with multicolored stars! <laughs> oh, Foxtrot! <laughs> Stage to say hello and to attend my own traumatic tale of Sweeney Todd that night. <laughs> After I told the story, you know what one of them said? Yeah, I noticed that. I didn't remember Anthony getting into a fight, but I thought, wow, that makeup is really good. <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is, when things go wrong in life or on the th in the theater, just keep moving on. <laughs> and then I moved on to get stitches for my friend in the ER. <laughs> hey, maybe there is an advantage to being a doctor even when you're doing a show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at my high school reunion last year, one of my classmates asked me when I decided to be a doctor. And I have to say, I'm not sure I ever actually made the decision, or at least a definite decision to be a doctor. You know what your decision is, which is not to decide. <laughs> it really was more like I never really made the definite decision not to be a doctor. I mean, I, I liked the idea of doing something that would help people, and I liked all the required science courses, so pre med seemed like a good option to keep open. So I got on the pre med track, and I kept liking each thing I was doing along the way, so I never had a reason to step off the track. I was always able to jump through each successive hoop successfully enough so nothing ever bumped me off the track and eventually I was a doctor. <laughs> Although I wonder if there isn't another reason. Psychologists say that a common defense to avoid dealing with painful emotion conflict is to bury yourself in your work. And I did wind up in a profession with one of the longest and most time-consuming training programs, so what was I trying to avoid? 
Well, in high school, I didn't date very much. You know, what little I did is, that's what everybody else did, and that's what you're supposed to do, right? Oh, it's not like I didn't like girls. I like them just fine. It's just, I like them more like girlfriends with a little G. <laughs> and not so much girlfriend with the capital G, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, I went through the motions, but to tell you the truth, I didn't see what all the fuss was about. <laughs> it was like that Peggy Lee song. Is that all there is? <laughs> Is that all there is? <laughs> I mean, I would have a crush on this boy or that boy from time to time, although I didn't really recognize it as such. I just thought I wanted to be friends. Really good friends. <laughs> if I liked a guy, I would just ignore him for fear of being found out. So I buried myself in my schoolwork. I was president of the chorus. I was captain of our academic challenge team. I was the class valedictorian. Well, there was a lot of emotional conflict to bury, a lot of onion to keep unpeeled. So fast forward to 10 years after high school graduation to my final year of my internal medicine residency. I'm making, I'm making life and death decisions and advising my patients on all sorts of issues, physical and emotional, sometimes ironically about struggles with same-sex attraction feelings. Oh, and I'm good at it. I know exactly what to say, exactly how to help them. It's always easier to know what someone else should do, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm 28 years old, but in some ways I'm still stuck emotionally at 16, still waiting for something just out of reach, but the only thing stopping me is me. Physician, heal thyself! <laughs> so old friend, now it's time to start the growing up. Taking charge, seeing things as they are. Facing facts, not escaping them, still with dreams, just reshaping them, growing up. Something had to change. And, poetically enough, it started that New Year's Day. Hmm. The day for new resolutions. The day for turning over a new leaf. It was going to be beautiful weather, so my friend Cameron had invited me to go hiking in the Angeles National Forest with him and some of his other friends. And one of those friends would turn out to be my first real boyfriend. Now, John was different than anyone I'd ever met before. Certainly different than my medical friends, even compared to some of my actor friends, he was pretty exotic and that saying quite a lot. <laughs> he made his living teaching yoga. He burned incense to induce relaxation. He played singing Tibetan bowls to reduce stress. He was friendly, had a good sense of humor, and wasn't so hard to look at either. <laughs> I was totally fascinated, but being me, I kept things cool and casual. But during the day, he mentioned that he had this ache in his neck and asked me if I would massage him a little. So I did. And he said, oh, that feels good. You have healing hands. I have healing hands? Who knew? <laughs> oh, like none of you have ever fallen for a corny line before. <laughs> the thing is, the first time someone says something like that to you, it's not so corny. Anyway, at the end of the day, and we're all saying our goodbyes. And, well, yeah, it was great meeting you too. Yeah, I'd love to get together sometime and hang out. Saturday? Well, I have to work. Late. Oh, not till 10 o'clock. That's not too late. <laughs> um, I guess I could come by. So excited. <laughs> Well, excited and scared, <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> so I went by after 10 on Saturday night. We meditated. We burned incense. We played the Tibetan bowls until they sang. <laughs> oh. We talked. And then, well, let's just say by the next morning, I wasn't stuck emotionally at 16 anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Love, I hear, makes you sigh a lot. 
all so long, I hear, leaves you weak. Love, I hear, makes you blush and turns you ashen. You try to speak with passion as quick, I hear. <laughs> Love, they say, makes you pine away, but you pine away with an idiotic grin. I pine, I flush, I squeak, I squawk, today I woke too weak to walk. What's love I hear, I feel, I fear, I mean. I'm sick, I'm sore, I never felt so well before. What's love I hear, I feel, I fear, I know I am, I'm sure, I mean, I hope, I trust, I pray. I felt like calling Peggy Lee and setting her straight, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> it was wonderful, as it is with first love. And after seven months, when we broke up, I was devastated for a while, as it is with first love. And I thought, why did you waste so much time on other people's opinions? And then I thought, for someone who's supposed to be so smart, how can you be so stupid? <laughs> and then I thought, quit thinking so much. <laughs> Just feel. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> but every journey begins with that first step. And journeys, whether geographic or emotional, take you to new places, either in the world or in your life. When I finished my residency later that year, I felt like I needed a break after what seemed like a million years of school. So what better way than to hit the road? I bought a one-way plane ticket to Japan, and for seven and a half months, I just kept going westward, exploring and wandering the world. I couldn't get enough. I love to travel, don't you? I like a change of pace, I like a change of space, I like to see a place that's absolutely new. I like to travel, don't you? On my travels, I spent two weeks checking in Nepal, very much off the grid. No electricity, no running water, no need for clocks. I mean, you wake up when the sun comes up, you hike the trail, eat when you're hungry, rest when you're tired, find a place to sleep when... Uh, when the sun goes down? And what you left behind, behind at home, your stuff, your job, your preconceived notions of how things are and how things should be don't matter. Here I am with my Sherpa guide Gokarna at the top of the Annapurna Base Camp Trail at 14,000 feet. It was amazing. And I learned that people are just people. So much more alike than different. All looking for the same things. Happiness. Security, love. It was a lesson I didn't learn in 23 years of formal schooling, but only by going out and taking on the real world. Take me to the world that's real. Show me how it's done. Teach me how to laugh, to feel. Move me to the sun. Just hold my hand whenever we arrive. Take me to a world where I can be alive. In a way, I've literally traveled around the world in search of me. 
and that's okay. I mean, I've learned that the journey is at least important, if not more important, than the destination. I mean, whatever you think happens after this lifetime, all the roads in the yellow wood wind up in the same place. But what matters most is how you travel along the way. I am so happy with where I am in the yellow wood right now, and the road I took to get there. And I'm so happy that your roads cross paths with mine, even if only for tonight. And maybe will all of us take a little of each other with us for tomorrow. We shall see the world come true. We shall have the world. music and were always so supportive and encouraging of all my various activities and interests. To the rest of my family and all my friends, including my musical director extraordinaire on the piano tonight, Jim Hatton. Four by Ten Ensemble's next production called Bagels that will be opening on this stage exactly one week from tonight. So please come back and see that too. I'm also grateful to my first boyfriend, John, who pointed me in the right direction <laughs> until I finally found my last boyfriend, who after 25 years is now my husband, Tom. Yay! for putting up with countless nights sitting at home alone. Ironically, not usually because I'm a doctor on call, but usually because I'm an actor in the theater. Oh, and it was Tom who first told me I should do a one-man show. Yeah. And then he kept telling me and telling me until I finally realized he was right, which he usually is. I wouldn't be who I am without him. So many people in the world, and what can they do? They'll never know love like my love for you. So many people laugh at what they don't know, but that's their concern. If just a few say half a million or so, us they've learned so many people in the world don't know what they missed they never believe such joy could exist and if they tell us it's a thing will outgrow they're jealous as they can be with so many people in the world, you love Now checked off the bucket list. <laughs> Woo! Done. Done. Yeah. Uh, there's still a few 
few others. Over the years, I've been fortunate enough to have done 11 different Stephen Sondheim musicals, including nine of the main 15 original ones for which he wrote both music and lyrics. And on my bucket list is trying to do as many of the remaining six as possible. Now don't get me wrong, I'm so grateful for having done the ones I've already have done. And, well, I mean, how many actors can claim full productions of Passion, Pacific Overtures, and Anyone Can Whistle? I mean, it's got to be a pretty short list. Right? <laughs> Each one is so rarely done, even one is a prize, let alone all three. And I recognize knocking off the others is more of a pipe dream than a realistic expectation, not even including the non-traditional casting factor. But every now and then, I can't help but dream a little. <laughs> finishing the list <laughs> How I'd love to finish the list How I would accept any role I was offered If I could just finish the list I play any part The dog or the bench <laughs> I see you pondering Could he pass as French? Sunday in the park with joy you won't be sorry, I'd be so grateful <laughs> if you could only imagine me in company. <laughs> what is the best thing that ever has happened to me? You know. Okay then, what of the best that has happened to me? Better than a Saturday night in bed. Singing and dancing a Saturday night instead. Frogs, yes, the frogs. Well, I could be a frog. And the casting is a non traditional. See, the frogs and race is non conditional. Just a multi ethnically diverse and cross cultural frog. <laughs> Even so, I've got the right to my dreams. Breaking news, while I'm not actually playing one of the killers, I am currently in rehearsal for a production of Sondheim's Assassin. <laughs> number 10 on my list of the 15 major fully Sondheim shows and my number 12 overall. Yay! <laughs> if I did, putting it together. <laughs> We open August 21st to play for six weekends at the Pico Playhouse in West LA. You can pick up one of these, <laughs> one of these postcards in a stack in the lobby as you as you leave. There's more information about the show and how to get tickets. Well, I hope to see you all there. Or to paraphrase Franklin Shepard, come and bring a friend. Come and make a friend. <laughs> When your life is like a Stephen Sondheim musical, even pipe dreams can come true. I had a dream. I still have a dream. Next lifetime, Mama Rose! Everybody's got the right to their dream.
to the 